My name is Carrie, and I'm the Director of Ministries here at Experience Christian Church. We're so excited you're joining us, whether that be live on a Sunday morning or on demand through the week. If you're new here, have a question about something at Experience, or if we could be praying for you, please text ECC info to 94000 and I'll get you connected. As service is about to get started with worship, I encourage you to grab some kind of bread or cracker and a drink to use later for communion. Today, we continue our series, Raw, Life Unfiltered. It's an exploration of the book of Psalms to see what it means to be completely honest with God about our feelings, our decisions, and our doubts. I invite you to read a Psalm a day and see what questions or observations come up for you. And if you'd like to talk to someone about it, please reach out. And now, Raw, Life Unfiltered. Thank you. 
I'm Matt Silver, the lead pastor here, and whether this is your first time joining in or you're a regular, thank you for being with us. If you have a question about anything related to experience or you have something we could be praying for you about, please text ECC Info to 94000. My really exciting news, next Sunday, August 15th, is our next in-person service, and the really exciting part is we are going to be at our new permanent location, which is the brand new park building on Route 30, otherwise known as the Boy Scout Building. This building is so new that it's not yet on some maps. So you might have to type in Auto Lenders of Exton in your GPS, and it's located across the street. Let me tell you how to get there. If you're driving towards downtown on Route 30 from Exton, you have the Audi on your left, then the Nissan dealership, the car wash, and then that's our space. We are so thrilled. It's brand new, it smells new, it's beautiful. If you can make it, we would love to have you join us in person. Sarah and the eKids team will be providing age-appropriate content, Andy and Sarah Webster from Woodland Community Church will be leading us in worship. It's going to be a great day. Be sure to invite a friend to join you as well. You can go to experiencecorg slash events to register or click the link in our chat. If you still feel uneasy about joining in person or you're traveling, no problem. Know that you can still be part of our service online at 10 a.m. We do intend to gather at this location weekly beginning September 12th, so be sure to mark your calendars for that. 
but we're also going to continue to offer weekly digital services with one change. We will be discontinuing hosting the service on Facebook. You'll be able to access the service by going to experiencecc.org slash live. And what this does is it allows us to use our website platform and it's a lot more engaging and we're excited to have our online community all at one place. If you're watching on Facebook this week, know that next week we'll have a link posted on Facebook to direct you towards our website. And finally, the mission of experience is to show others the love of God, and this is made possible in part by the generous partnering of our community. If you would like to join us on this mission, you can go do so safely by going to GiveToExperience.com. Well, today our friend Nathan McDay will be bringing the message, Let's Lean In as we continue our series, Raw, Life Unfiltered. Well, hello, Experienced Christian Church. It is good to be with you again. And uh, I'm just honored, as always, to join with what God is doing in and through this community. And I've begun to really long for the day when I'll get to come and meet you all and actually be with you uh, face to face. We're in this new series called Raw Life Unfiltered, which uh, began last week. And we're studying together this incredible biblical book called the Psalms. And before we go any further, today I just wanted to stop and say a quick prayer. So uh, join your hearts with me, if you would. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and even pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I'm coming to you, as always, from Indiana, where I live now, and part of what I do these days is uh, some work as a hospital chaplain, and I serve in the Indianapolis area and kind of just north of the city in several different towns, and one of those towns is Kokomo. Now, when you hear the word Kokomo, um, maybe you've heard of Kokomo, Indiana, but I bet that way more of you, when you hear the word Kokomo, you think of what? You think of the hit song by the Beach Boys, right? You think of Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, I wanna take ya. Bermuda, Bahama, come on pretty mama. Key Largo, Montego, baby, why don't we go down to Kokomo? And I bet that many of you like me have always assumed that off the Florida Keys, there's a place called Kokomo. That's where you wanna go to get away from it at all. And that, uh, in this place called Kokomo, if you were able to get away from it at all and go there, uh, you would see things like bodies in the sand, tropical drinks melting in people's hands, people falling in love to the rhythm of a steel drum band, people who got there fast, but now they're taking it slow. Um, well, guess what? That place does not exist. There is no such actual place down near the Florida Keys and all those other tropical locations mentioned that is called Kokomo. It is completely made up. Now, some people have cleverly gone and named some different beaches, different resorts, so forth, Kokomo, since the song came out. But it's actually not a real place. Uh, I did a Google, Google image search, and the first 5.5 rows of pictures, the first 32 images, before you actually got to a picture of Kokomo, Indiana, were of tropical locations for this Kokomo that is not even a real place, but Kokomo, Indiana is a real place. It was incorporated in 1855. It's about an hour from my house. There are no palm trees and one doesn't really get there fast. Uh, but in the real Kokomo, there are real people. They're living and working and playing and sometimes going to the hospital. And there's joy and there's sorrow and laughter and pain and birth and death and real life. So I learned this fact just this past week that, that the Kokomo from the song is just a made up place. And it made me laugh uh, that there is actually no tropical, sexy Kokomo island paradise, right? Instead, there's only, with all due respect, Kokomo, Indiana. And I thought uh, immediately how this is a great metaphor for talking about the Psalms. Often, I think, we get caught up in trying to live the lives we, we want to we, we wanted our lives to be, uh, maybe what we expected them to be, which is probably something more like the Kokomo from the song, right? Everything ideal, romantic, perfect. But then we quickly find ourselves disappointed, depressed, derailed, disillusioned by the crushing weight of reality. 
by the struggles of our real lives. And we lack a lot of times the spiritual foundation and the tools to deal with this, to deal with our actual lives, which are difficult and complicated and messy, and which have turned out to be a lot more like perhaps a town in Indiana than some kind of tropical island paradise. Maybe every now and then we actually do get to kind of get away from it all. Uh, but often even that, even our, our vacations, our brief escapes, only serve to amplify the fact that most of our lives are not really all that inspiring. They're, they're not writing any pop songs about them most of the time. Well, I have some great news, given that reality. God has given us some amazing gifts that help us to learn how to live in the day-to-day -day ordinariness of our lives, and even to do so with depth and beauty and hope. And one of the greatest of these gifts that God has given us is this biblical book called The Psalms that we're studying together now. If you missed last week, please go back and watch Matt's message for a great background and overview of the Psalms. The Psalms are found right in the middle of the Bible. It's a collection of 150 poems and songs of the people of Israel. And uh, then it kind of became the prayer book of the church uh, since its inception, actually since even before its inception. Think about this. The Psalms were the prayer book of Jesus when he was growing up. The Psalms are perhaps the main way that Jesus himself learned to pray. That right there could be the whole sermon. That should be enough to just wake us up to the great gift that it is that we have access to the Psalms and to motivate us to dive into them. The Psalms, along with uh, the prophet Isaiah, these are the Old Testament books most quoted and referenced in the New Testament. And the Psalms is the book that is most often asked for uh, by patients and families that I most often find myself going to and referencing and reading and using with people as in my work as a chaplain. Uh, because it's just perfect for these times when I am trying to be present with people in uh, some of the hardest moments of their lives. Now, why is it? Why is that that, that Psalms is the go-to book for these types of things? Because the Psalms are so real and so raw and so honest, and they meet us right in the middle of the messiness of our actual lives to offer us comfort and perspective and hope. I love the uh, image that Matt gave us last week, for, passed along from Philip Yancey, uh, of Psalms being, the book of Psalms being like a chance for us to look over the shoulder of these biblical authors, these people inspired by God who are telling uh, about the highs and lows of their lives and, and, and continuing to worship God through all of that. Matt, who by the way is the lead pastor of this church, in case you're new, you wonder who this Matt is I'm talking about, he also included a great Tim Keller quote about the Psalms last week. And I was going to say, uh, I see that quote and I raise you this one. This one is by a man named Athanasius, Athanasius of Alexandria from back in the fourth century. He says, it is my view that in the words of this book, the whole human life, its basic spiritual conduct, as well as its occasional movements and thoughts is comprehended and contained. Nothing to be found in human life is omitted in the book of the Psalms. Wow, that is a huge statement. What Athanasius is saying, and I am too, uh, is that there is no better way for us as individuals and communities to learn the language of prayer, to pick up the vocabulary, the rhythms, the structures, the nuances of authentic, faithful prayer than to immerse ourselves in the Psalms. So that's what we're doing in this series and hopefully beyond, accepting and enjoying this great gift from God called the Psalms, and uh, which also sometimes is referred to as the Psalter, just another way, way of saying the book of the Psalms. Now, as far as resources, Matt mentioned a couple last week that I want to mention again. Tim Keller has a one-year journal called The Songs of Jesus. Uh, also, this video you can find on YouTube by The Bible Project, their video on the Psalms, it's so good. If you have uh, eight minutes, I think it's less than nine minutes long. It's such a good use of your time. Overview of what the Psalms are about. Um, two more that I'll add real quickly. One is this book called the Paraclete Psalter. 
And it's just four weeks, it's pretty thin little books, four weeks of daily prayers at the four traditional times, morning, midday, evening, and nighttime, uh, all based on the Psalms. And it takes you through the book in a very organized way. I highly recommend it. I use it from time to time um, and really love it. And then I also wanna recommend the Psalms in music form. In my opinion, most of the best worship songs are ones that just take most or all of their lyrics straight from the Bible. And um, especially the Psalms, they're, they're, they're just ready made for it, right? Uh, there's some guys called Shane and Shane, Shane Bernard and Shane Everett, who have done some great uh, versions of the songs, the Psalms in song form. But uh, there's lots of others out there. So if, you're, if you connect through music, uh, check out the Psalms in that way. So my assignment for today was to choose one Psalm out of the 150 that has been meaningful to me and share about it, teach about it. Uh, so I chose today Psalm 19, which is one that has meant a lot to me both recently and over the course of my life, especially the very last verse. So we're just gonna kind of go through it verse by verse or section by section and talk a little bit about Psalm 19. It goes like this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. The Olympics are going on right now. I love that line, how it conjures up some images. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now, verse one there, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. That is the winner for Bible verse most likely to be the caption in a Christian girl's Instagram post of a sunrise or a sunset. And you know what? Rightly so. What the psalmist is saying here is that when we see the wonders of nature, and in particular the rising and the setting of the sun, we as human beings cannot help but become aware of the reality and the glory of God. Sunrises and sunsets and the, the, all those wonders of nature, as the Apostle Paul says near the beginning of Romans, they leave us without excuse to acknowledge the existence of God and the attributes of God's divine nature. The psalmist says that without ever saying a word, these things, the, these beautiful, majestic things in our world speak volumes to us about God. On to the next section, verse 7 and following. The psalmist goes a little further, says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Okay, I wanna pause right here. There's actually one more verse in what we call this section, second section. But uh, right here I wanna say that these words, all these words, the law, the statutes, the precepts, the commands, the decrees, uh, in other translations, it says things like the rules of God, the testimony, all of this is pointing toward something called Torah. It's a Hebrew word. Uh, maybe the best translation from what I've studied would just be the instructions of God. Uh, and it has multiple levels of meaning here. Uh, like kind of Torah with a small t would be like, in a general sense, all of the instructions and the teachings of God. And in a specific sense, let's say Torah with a capital T or Torah, uh, that would be the first five books of the Bible right? The books of Moses, the foundation of uh, the Hebrew Jewish faith, and then therefore of the Christian faith, the first, the bedrock, the baseline teachings on which it all builds, uh, leading all the way up to Christ and beyond. Um, so the psalmist is saying these things, these teachings of God, they're things you can lean on. They're things you can count on. 
They're things you can build your life on. And the, as we read, they'll give you, if you follow them, things like refreshment, wisdom, joy, endurance. Notice uh, in the first section that we read, we just had the word God, which is sort of the general term. But here in the second section, the psalmist begins to say, Lord, which L-O-R-D with all caps, when you read that in your English Bible, it actually is a placeholder for the name of God that God gives, which is Yahweh, okay? Which is a form of how God introduced himself by saying, I am that I am, the great I am, right? The specific name, in other words, of the God of Israel that he gave to his people. So what's going on here in the Psalm is it's going up a notch. Not only do the wonders of nature point us clearly to our loving, powerful creator God, but what's more, that same God has spoken in history, introduced God's self by name, Yahweh, our Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who walked among us uh, in, and as Jesus Christ, the God who continues to move among us in the form of the Holy Spirit, that mysterious trinity that we worship and follow. So we, in other words, we no longer just have to discern God's character from the wonders of nature. We now also have all this specific info, stories, events, testimony in actual history about God's character and intentions, how God rolls, what God has done, and where it's all heading. And again, this is wonderful news for us. And then that last verse in this section, verse 11, says, By them your servant is warned, them being all these instructions, this Torah, and in keeping them there is great reward. Other translations at the beginning of that verse have a word like moreover, in addition to what we just heard. You're, you know, there's more. Uh, the message translation says it this way. There's more. God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. The, st the psalm here is starting to kind of sound like a late night TV infomercial. Uh, the offer keeps getting better, but wait, there's more. Not only are the laws and statutes and instructions of God a blessing to us, but what's more, our loving God then uses these to care for us. And in kind of from both ends, he warns us of danger and he guides us and leads us to treasure. God gives us, if we will walk in his ways, he gives us protection and blessing. And this is an amazing promise and a gift to his people. And now finally, we come to the, the last section, the final three verses of this short little psalm. And really, these verses are just a simple prayer. Verse 12 says, but who can discern their own errors? Um, this is about acknowledging our, our limitations and our failures, saying, I don't, I don't even know all the things that I, the ways that I've failed. Um, forgive my hidden faults. God, um, in 13, 13 says, keep your servant also from willful sins. Other translations say things like presumptuous sins. One I read even said from stupid sins. And this is this kind of side note uh, says that there are different kinds of sins. There's sort of the, this, the goof ups, you know, the innocent mistakes that we make that pull us away from God. But this is talking about more like the Keep us, God, from choosing to sin. Keep us, God, from, uh, and it says, may they not rule over me. Keep us from habitual sin. Keep us from addictions uh, that, are, that are hurtful to us. It says, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And then we come to this final verse, which has meant so much to me. And I, I bet maybe you've even heard this before. It says this, the psalmist ends the psalm with this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. This is one of the Bible verses that I and so many others have returned to countless times throughout the years. This is one of the most useful and widely applicable and evergreen prayers ever spoken or written by anyone. Uh, this is such a simple prayer that you could memorize it today and have access to it for the rest of your life. Lord, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love that some translations say pleasing. I like that even better than acceptable as an English word there. So that's my desire. I wanna please God with my life. Now, 
I think you do too, whether you realize it or not. I think everyone does. Not only the things I say, you know, this prayer is saying, God, the things I think as well. This is the next level. God, yes, I need you to give me self-control over the words of my mouth. But even more than that, God, I want you to transform me from the inside out. I want you to change my heart. The word heart here in this psalm representing the core of who I am, the, the center of consciousness and where thoughts are formed and emotions are processed. That's what's being talked about here. Um, and, you know, if you know anything about Jesus and what he taught, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, you can hear echoes of this prayer in that kind of teaching. Um, not, not it, It's not only a sin to kill someone, it's a sin to hate someone in your heart, right? These types of things. And so then this prayer just ends with the words, Oh Lord, again, that personal specific name, implying relationship. My rock and my redeemer, my rock, something solid. That which does not shift and move though everything else does in culture, in the world something that is real and not imaginary, something trustworthy, somewhere where I can anchor and build my life, my rock and my redeemer, the one who comes and saves me because I can't save myself. The one who says, this one's mine. The one who defines my value and gives me purpose even when I've lost sight of those things. This little prayer, which I timed myself, it takes about eight or nine seconds to say. It's one I have prayed when starting my day. It's one I've prayed when, when I see a beautiful woman who's not my wife and I'm tempted to let my mind go places it should not. It's one I say uh, when I see my neighbor who has not treated me well and I'm tempted to let my mouth say things that it should not. It's one I say when I'm overwhelmed as a dad. It's one I say uh, when heading into meetings or conversations I know will be difficult. It's one I say and have said when right in the middle of conversations, things are just suddenly heating up, getting out of control. I've learned to pause, take a drink of water, buy myself those nine seconds and silently say this prayer. It's one I say when getting ready to lead something or speak publicly or preach a sermon. It's one I say when facing a big decision and the list goes on and on. And guess what? And I just thought of this for the first time um, this go round and studying and thinking about this prayer, I realize there's no reason we can't also pray this prayer over others, over our kids, over their teachers, over our pastors, over our coworkers, over our political leaders. Lord, let the words of his or her mouth and the meditations of his or her heart be acceptable in your sight and let them know and be rem or be reminded today or come to know for the first time that you are our only true rock and redeemer. As I think about it, I have no doubt that this little prayer has made a huge impact in the, in the direction, in the shape of my life, more than I'll probably ever know this side of heaven. And this is just one verse from one of 150 Psalms, which is one of 66 books in the Bible. And I, as I think about that and the power of that, I'm just so grateful. It's such a gift. So again, don't hear this. Don't enter into this series feeling like oh i gotta do i gotta read the bible i got just i hope you'll see it as a gift as an opportunity to unwrap an amazing gift from our loving god you know one of my favorite definitions of prayer right what is prayer uh is just this prayer is saying the truest thing you are able to say to god at a given moment sometimes that uh, is just a groan right but I'm so thankful and I thank you, oh God, for the Psalms, which give us words when maybe we didn't have any of our own, which help us to experience and express the whole range of human emotion. Thank you, God, for the Psalms, which unite us with other God lovers and uh, worshipers down through the ages and across the globe. Thank you for the Psalms, which keep us anchored to our rock and which keep our vision focused on our Redeemer. Would you please join your hearts with me as I just offer a closing prayer? Oh God, sometimes we know when and how we have sinned against you. Other times we can't even figure out what we're doing right or wrong. Please forgive our hidden faults. 
Dear God, would you please keep us, keep the people of Experience Christian Church from willful sins. Convict us and give us strength to choose the better way. And when we do stumble in sin, please God, don't let those sins become habits ruling over us. God, our desire, whether we even know it or not, and I do believe it's desi the desire of every human heart, is to stand blameless and innocent before you, to feel your love and your approval. So Lord, our prayer today is that the words of our mouths, today, tomorrow, and all days, would be pleasing to you. And that the meditations of our hearts, the direction we point our minds, would also be pleasing to you. Good, clean, holy, helpful words and thoughts, or else silence, God. And we ask all of this with great confidence, knowing that you love us and that you are our solid rock and our redeemer. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Each week here at Experience, we have the opportunity to take communion together as a church family, to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross. When I take communion, I really like to reflect on my past week and the week to come. In what moments did I need some grace this week? And next week, how can I honor the sacrifice Jesus made for us, both in a spiritual sense and in practical ways? So let's take our elements, the bread and the juice, and we'll take communion together. First, we'll take the bread, which represents the body of Christ. And now we'll take the juice, which represents the blood of Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you sent your son here to earth and that you sacrificed him on the cross, uh, not, for, not for you, God, but for us. And I just thank you so much for this time spent together this morning um, and that we're able to come together as a community and to remember that sacrifice Jesus made together. God, it's all in your name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us. We are so thankful for the time we spent together today, but it doesn't have to end here. Check out our chat box or our website for more ways to connect. See you soon.